For weeks, the ground beneath one of America's most dangerous volcanoes has been shivering with thousands of tiny jolts. Beginning on July 8th, Mount Rainier's slopes and the surrounding region of Washington State have registered a surge of seismic activity unlike anything recorded there in recent memory. Seismologists monitoring the mountain logged more than 10,000 distinct events in less than a month, with the swarm's early days producing dozens of quakes every hour. Yet now, official updates have slowed to a trickle, key monitoring stations have gone dark, and the count of earthquakes in the U.S. Geological Survey's public catalogue has been abruptly curtailed. Official statements assure the public that there is no sign of magma movement, but in the absence of transparent, up-to-date numbers, independent observers are beginning to ask whether the full story is being told. At first glance, the official explanation appears straightforward. The July swarm, the USGS says, was a mix of small earthquakes and surface events, ice breaking from Rainier's glaciers, rocks tumbling down steep slopes, landslides triggered by unusually warm summer rain, even wind gusts rattling the slopes. Based on their analyses, as much as 80% of the detected signals could be attributed to such surface noise. The rest were low-magnitude quakes, many of them too weak to be felt, and all of them far from threatening. By August, they say, the swarm had largely tapered off, returning the volcano to what they consider background levels of activity. But the instruments still tell a more complicated story. Seismographs in the northern sector of the swarm area, between Rainier and the neighbouring Mount St. Helens, continue to register bursts of shaking on an almost daily basis. Much of this activity is clustered beneath western Washington, where the subducting Juan de Fuca plate grinds slowly beneath the North American plate. In this locked zone, the two plates are stuck together in places, storing strain that can only be released through gradual slip, deep tremor bursts, or in more catastrophic scenarios, major earthquakes. The tremor patterns seen in recent weeks bear the hallmarks of this tectonic interaction, suggesting that the activity may be part of a deeper, more complex process than glacial icefalls. The swarm's evolution has also raised eyebrows among those familiar with volcanic seismicity. In its earliest phase, the swarm began just south of Rainier's summit, then migrated eastward before turning north. Over the course of days, the centre of activity shifted roughly 2.4 kilometres, about 1.5 miles, to its current location. Such migration patterns are more commonly associated with processes beneath the surface, such as the movement of pressurised fluids, whether magma or superheated water through fractured rock. The July swarm's waveform patterns, with their longer duration and specific frequency signatures, match earthquake patterns seen in volcanic systems rather than the abrupt high-frequency spikes of surface disturbances. Now, in August, those waveforms are still appearing, even if their intensity has waned from the swarm's peak. This is where the transparency issue becomes critical. In July, the preliminary earthquake catalogue listed a staggering 10,834 detected events. But in August, only 28 small earthquakes have been officially processed and posted, the largest of which was a modest magnitude 1.0. Independent analysts monitoring raw seismic feeds say that the number grossly understates the ongoing tremor activity, much of which remains visible on continuous waveform data. Their concern is not that a major eruption is imminent, but that the suppression or reclassification of quake data prevents the public and scientific community from understanding exactly what is happening beneath the mountain. Compounding the scepticism is the apparent downgrading or loss of some seismic stations. At least one key station southwest of the volcano has gone offline entirely, while others have had their data display adjusted so that quake amplitudes appear smaller on public feeds, making them harder to spot at a glance. The USGS has not issued any detailed explanation for these outages or adjustments. While such technical changes may be routine, a matter of equipment maintenance, calibration or filtering out noise, the lack of communication fuels speculation among those already suspicious of official narratives. Mount Rainier's Seismic Monitoring Network is part of the Pacific Northwest Seismic Network, PNSN, which, in partnership with the USGS Cascades Volcano Observatory, operates dozens of stations across the region. 
These stations are sensitive enough to detect earthquakes with magnitudes well below zero. Tiny shifts in rock that humans cannot feel, but that, collectively, can reveal changes in a volcano's internal plumbing. The decision about which quakes are located and added to the official catalogue depends on whether an event is recorded on multiple stations and meets certain detection thresholds. This means many tremors never appear in the public list, even if they are visible to those watching raw waveforms in real time. In July, the swarm produced quakes at a depth of about 2 to 6 kilometres, roughly 1.2 to 3.7 miles, beneath Rainier's summit. These depths are too far below the ice to be explained by surface avalanches, and their location is squarely within the volcano's hydrothermal and magma-influenced zones. At the same time, there was no detectable ground swelling on GPS instruments and no unusual gas emissions, which would be expected if magma were rising toward the surface. Instead, the pattern suggested that superheated water or steam in the hydrothermal system might be shifting, changing pressures in the surrounding rock and triggering small quakes. Such swarms are not unprecedented at Rainier. Smaller bursts of similar activity have been recorded in past decades, including one in 2009 that lasted just three days and involved about 120 earthquakes. But the 2025 swarm's sheer scale, in both the number of events and the length of time they persisted, sets it apart. It is, by USGS admission, the largest recorded swarm in the volcano's history. That makes the lack of ongoing detailed public reporting in August all the more puzzling to outside observers. For those trying to make sense of this activity, it is important to understand Rainier's unique position in the Cascade Range. At 4,392 metres, 14,410 feet, it is the highest mountain in the Cascades and is covered by more than 93 square kilometres, 36 square miles of glaciers, more than any other US volcano outside Alaska. This thick ice cover is a major reason Rainier is considered the most dangerous volcano in the United States. Even a small eruption, or a major slope collapse without an eruption, could rapidly melt vast quantities of ice, generating lahars, fast-moving torrents of mud and debris that could thunder down valleys and into communities tens of kilometres away. The Puyallup, Carbon and Nisqually River valleys all have histories of such flows, and today they are home to tens of thousands of people. The last major eruption of Rainier occurred about 500 to 600 years ago, producing ash falls and pyroclastic flows that reshaped the surrounding landscape. Since then, smaller eruptions and large landslides have occurred, with the electron mud flow around the year 1500 travelling more than 55 kilometres, 34 miles, from the mountain. The fact that Rainier has been relatively quiet in historic times does not diminish its hazard potential. In fact, the long repose period means pressure could be building unseen. That is why seismologists pay close attention to even small changes in the mountain's behaviour. Given all this, the halting of detailed quake counts and the apparent scaling back of seismic visibility during an ongoing swarm inevitably raise questions. Is the activity truly winding down, or is it being reclassified in ways that obscure its true nature? Could there be subtle changes in the volcano's internal systems, such as deep fluid migration, that are not immediately dangerous but still significant? Without full access to the data, the public is left to rely on official summaries and the watchful eyes of independent seismic analysts whose interpretations sometimes diverge from the USGS's cautious framing. For now, the agency's position remains that there is no cause for alarm, no indication of magma movement and no change in the volcano's alert level, which stays at green or normal. But the contrast between raw seismic traces showing ongoing unrest and official counts suggesting near dormancy ensures that the debate over transparency will continue, especially among those who believe the mountain's story is not yet fully told. To fully grasp what is at stake, it is necessary to understand the forces shaping this restless patch of the Pacific Northwest. Mount Rainier does not exist in isolation. It is the product of a collision that has been unfolding for millions of years. Off the coast of Washington, the Juan de Fuca Plate, a remnant of the ancient Farallon Plate, is being pushed beneath the North American Plate at a rate of about 4 centimetres, 1.6 inches per year. 
This subduction zone is part of the Cascadia Megathrust, a 1,000-kilometer, 620-mile, fault capable of producing magnitude 9 earthquakes. As the oceanic plate slides downward, it carries water-rich sediments deep into the mantle. These release fluids into the overlying mantle wedge, lowering the melting point of the rock and generating magma. It is this magma, slowly rising over geologic time, that built the chain of Cascade volcanoes from Mount Lassen in California to Mount Baker in Washington. Mount Rainier's magmatic plumbing system sits above this volatile interface. Deep beneath the mountain, molten rock coexists with a hydrothermal system of scalding water and steam, circulating through fractures and porous rock layers. It is a delicate balance. Small shifts in pressure, temperature or chemical composition can trigger swarms of micro-earthquakes without leading to an eruption. These swarms often happen when fluids, whether magmatic or purely hydrothermal, move into new spaces, forcing rock to crack. In some cases, tectonic tremor from deeper slip along the plate boundary can also migrate upward, interacting with volcanic systems. The July 2025 swarm, given its depth and progression, fits several possible scenarios. One is that a pulse of superheated water migrated through the volcano's mid-crustal fracture network. As it moved, it would have raised pore pressure in the surrounding rock, reducing the friction that holds faults in place. This is consistent with the swarm's spatial migration and the fact that it originated just south of the summit before shifting east and north. Another possibility is that deep tremor from the Juan de Fuca North America interface propagated upward into Rainier's edifice, momentarily destabilizing its hydrothermal system. Such deep tremor bursts are usually undetectable without sensitive instrumentation, but they can coincide with bursts of shallow seismicity in nearby volcanic systems. What makes the current situation contentious is not the science itself, but the gap between what can be observed in raw seismic data and what is communicated in official bulletins. Continuous waveform feeds still show clusters of events that look to trained eyes like small earthquakes rather than surface disturbances. The pattern of recurrence, sometimes in tight bursts, sometimes more evenly spaced, does not match the irregular scatter expected from rockfalls or ice collapses. While it is possible that some percentage of the detected events are indeed surface noise, the homogeneity of waveform shapes suggests a common source, likely underground. If these are indeed tectonic or volcanic microquakes, what do they mean for the near future? History offers some guidance. Many volcanoes worldwide experience prolonged swarms without erupting. For example, Mount St. Helens has had swarms lasting weeks with no surface activity, as have Alaska's Mount Spur and Iceland's Katla. At the same time, swarms have preceded eruptions in places like Mount Pinatubo in 1991 and Redoubt in 2009. The difference lies in the evolution of the signal. Swarms that grow in magnitude, become shallower, and are accompanied by deformation and gas emissions are far more worrisome than those that simply fade away. So far, Rainier's swarm shows no such escalation. Still, Rainier's hazard profile demands vigilance. A sudden shift from deep, low-magnitude swarms to vigorous shallow quakes could leave only days or even hours before an eruptive event or a massive slope collapse. Either could unleash lahars capable of racing down river valleys at speeds exceeding 50 kilometers per hour, 31 miles per hour, burying communities under meters of mud and debris. Even a non-eruptive landslide could melt enough ice to generate such a flow as happened during prehistoric collapses of Rainier's flanks. These risks are why the volcano is monitored year-round, why Lahar sirens are installed in nearby towns, and why emergency planners rehearse evacuation drills. In this context, the halting of detailed quake counts in early August becomes more than a technical footnote. It touches on public trust. The USGS and PNSN have an excellent track record of monitoring and warning, but the perception of withholding data, even if unintentional, can erode confidence. Communication during volcanic unrest is not just about preventing panic. It is also about ensuring that the public has the information it needs to make informed decisions. 
If thousands of microquakes are occurring, people expect to be told, even if the scientific consensus is that they are harmless. There is also the matter of scientific opportunity. Large swarms like this one are rare at Rainier, and they provide a window into processes that are otherwise invisible. High-resolution seismic data, if shared openly, could help researchers refine models of Rainier's internal structure, the connectivity of its hydrothermal system, and its response to tectonic stress. These insights would not only improve eruption forecasting for Rainier, but could also be applied to other glacier-clad volcanoes worldwide. Curtailing data access during such an event risks losing valuable context that cannot be recreated later. For now, independent seismologists and citizen scientists continue to track the activity with the tools available to them. Some run automated detection algorithms on public waveform feeds, tallying the events themselves. Others compare current patterns to historical swarms, looking for subtle shifts. While their interpretations vary, most agree that the swarm has not fully ended. The mountain is still whispering beneath its icy crown, even if those whispers are softer than the shouts of early July. In the end, Mount Rainier's 2025 swarm will likely be remembered as a remarkable but non-eruptive episode, a reminder of the mountain's restless nature and the complex interplay of tectonics, fluids and ice that defines it. But it will also serve as a case study in the challenges of communicating volcanic hazards in real time. How much data should be shared, and how quickly? How should agencies balance the risk of overinterpreting noise with the public's right to know? And how can scientists maintain credibility in an age where raw data is accessible to anyone with an internet connection? The answers to those questions may shape not only the next chapter in Rainier's story, but also the broader relationship between science, government and the public when it comes to natural hazards. For the communities living in the mountain shadow, the stakes are tangible. Life in the Cascades means living with both the beauty and the danger of these peaks. And while the current tremors may fade into memory without incident, the next swarm, or the one after that, could be the prelude to something far more consequential. Until then, the mountain waits. The plates continue their slow-motion collision deep beneath the Pacific Northwest. The ice shifts and creaks on Rainier's slopes. And somewhere in the dark heart of the volcano, fluids and stresses are on the move, occasionally tapping the crust hard enough to be heard. Whether those signals are counted, catalogued and communicated in full is a choice left to the agencies tasked with watching. For those who prefer to keep their own score, the seismographs remain, their lines trembling faintly, a reminder that even in apparent calm, Rainier is never truly still.